Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, on behalf of Hola LAX, Google Talks at, and Latino Heritage LA, I'd like to welcome everyone to our first Hispanic Heritage Month event, where we're gonna have a panel discussion, um, where we celebrate the vibrancy of Latinidad, or in many different aspects that make us Latino. Today we will hear firsthand from three very talented local Latina artists, each one of them providing their own take on what it means to be an artist in the US. I will start with Sandra, in the middle. Sandra Cornejo is a first-generation Salvadoran American artist born in Houston, Texas. Historical collective memory of post-Civil War Salvadoran culture is an important influence and inspiration for her work. She recently implemented a portfolio preparation course at Plaza de la Raza for students aspiring to continue their education and profession in the arts. Sandra received a VFA from VCU with a concentration in painting and printmaking. Recipient of the Ellen Battelle Stokel Fellowship, she attended the Yale Norfolk Summer Program. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> then we have Yolanda, all the way to the left, or to your right, <laughs> was born into a family whose artistic heritage dates back to 1877. Gonzalez's travels in different countries, the bonds forged with individuals in those places, and the resulting transformative experiences are reflected in her art and her life. She is known for her strong, bold brushstrokes of color and texture, intent on evoking imagination and emotion. She was an artist in residence in Ginza, Japan, followed by a similar stint in Assisi, Italy. Throughout the years, Gonzalez has taught various community organizations. You can see some of her work on the Gold Line trains as well as buses throughout LA in a collaboration with AARP. Yolanda studied at the Pasadena Art Center College of Design after winning a painting competition that awarded her a scholarship to the prestigious school. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. <laughs> of course. And now we have Rosalie Lopez a Los Angeles-based artist whose work involves combining cultural iconography with references of her everyday surroundings. At a young age, she was heavily impacted with the realities of loss, addictions, and violence within her immediate family, which continue to shape her perspectives on society and culture. She primarily uses printmaking, papel picado, installation, and the altar offering to relay experiences of survival, loss, and pride. Rosalie earned a Master of Fine Arts in Printmaking from Indiana University and dual Bachelor of Fine Arts degrees in Graphic Design and Printmaking from California State University, Long Beach. All three women have had their artwork exhibited in many museums around the country and internationally. So let's give them a warm welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> welcome to the Google Familia. This is Glad very exciting, super here. exciting Thank to you. do a you know, Hispanic <laughs> Heritage Month, first event, and we have you. Yay! <laughs> so I'm super, super excited to not only have you here, but also your artwork. If you haven't seen the fabulous display of artwork that we have here in the collection in the boardwalk, some people are like, what is the boardwalk? We have uh, in front of the barista, outside of Big Lebowski, that is our boardwalk. That's where we have um, six different artists displayed, and three of them are right here. So I love to know. So there was probably a thought process. Which artwork bring to Google? Was that hard? <laughs> like we, we have like six, four, one, Sandra, you specifically chose one, Yolanda like six, Rosalie chose four. I'm very interested, like the behind the scenes look at why these pieces and what the selection process was. So just so everybody knows, if we go to one slide, this is Yolanda's work. Yolanda, tell us about this. Why did you choose these very particular pieces to have here with us today? Well, I wanted to, um Ex exhibit something contemporary, something that was representational of my work, um, that was more recent, that had um, all of the texture that I usually use, the color that is known for the Chicano art. Um, and I wanted to send some of the works that I'm most excited about. Oh, very nice. Which are some still lifes and some portraits. And these are portraits of people that I know that are dear to me, uh, that represent um, strength, power, positive energy, and love. Thank you. And, and now that we're in the subject, I noticed that two of the paintings are called Diana something. Who is this Diana person? Well, <laughs> Diana Galicia is a very dear friend of mine, and her husband is uh, an incredible um, jewelry maestro. So this is oh, really? Diana's husband. This is oh. all of the work that he creates. And um, we've known each other for about um, 25 years. Wow. And uh, she's just a brilliant woman, brilliant, yes. powerful woman. Great. Oh, that's so nice. Do they have this artwork in their homes? 
Um, or this they do. They have some. Yeah. They have a house um, in Tolum, and they've taken some portraits that I've created of them to their home. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And then on the next page, um, we have Rosalie's work. Rosalie, you have four different pieces here with papel picado and different things. Tell us why these specific pieces. Uh, Kind of going off what Yolanda was saying, I wanted to pick work that exemplified uh, what I'm creating right now. Um, as a printmaker and someone who combines that with papel picado, I wanted to choose works that um, talk about the ofrenda and offering in um, a very contemporary way, in an untraditional somewhat ways. So um, I have a papel picado piece of an LA scene, um, a family portrait that I combine with LED lights and. Um, a couple other um, ofrenda pieces that are all papel picado. So I felt like together they make a grouping that really talks about um, the things that I feel embody uh, the concepts that I work with. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. So, so you do a lot. So you do these and also tons of other, like, because you combine. You installation art. Nice. Um, sometimes it's just pure printmaking um, mixed together, sometimes with papel picado. So I really enjoy uh, creating. Um, transforming spaces to give people an experience. So um, sometimes that means breaking out of the frame and, and uh, inhabiting a space. So nice. Yeah. Thank you. It's great. And now we're going to see Sandra's work. Oh, and yeah. Sandra is very specific. <laughs> you have like this big, huge artwork. It one piece. One. I'm very curious. <laughs> Why one? <laughs> one piece. Well, it's, it's a group of work um, that I'm currently working on. I tend to work in series. Um, so at the moment, I'm exploring notions of childhood, um, memory, nostalgia, like what drives that nostalgic power. Um, in this image is, you know, is it something that's been romanticized, something that's been skewed? Like why, why, like what does, like why does it have that power? So I love kind of like asking these questions as I'm making the work. So as you see this piece, it's, representational yet has very abstract elements to it. So kind of like a push and pull, like an inquiry of my past, like where I come from. Um, so it's a very tender, loving memory. Um, you know, it's a bit like discombobulated and may make sense and it might ring truth to some, some of my viewers, I hope, so. No, I loved it. Yeah, so, yeah all the work is beautiful. And it, I thought it was very powerful that you just chose one. Yeah. Like this is, I need to know more. <laughs> um, so I, I'd like to know also, um, so you were talking about themes mm -hmm. and how right now you're working on this theme of like childhood. Yeah. What drives a theme? Like when, for all three of you, when you work on a theme, what is that driver or that influence to go on that theme? Mm. How do you choose the theme that is next? Well, there tends to be themes that I've been working with for a really long time. So whether it's commemorating a, a figure like in a monolithic space, like one figure in a space, like why? Like telling a story, okay. always very narrative-like. Um, so childhood, social justice, where I'm from, El Salvador, like it's history. So it's very historically based and I'm always seeking out a narrative. And whatever that narrative may be, that's the image that surfaces, so. Great. Yeah. Um, how, how does it work for both of you? I think for myself, uh, it's something that's very personal. And um, I try to cover narratives that are um, what people are going through along with myself. Okay. And that reality and how that reality is portrayed on canvas uh, in a beautiful manner. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in my case, I feel like I'm very much um, inspired by um, my community, my neighborhood, mm -hmm. and um, in the beginning, a lot of my work was definitely like influenced by the Los Muertos altars and how women would use these altars as a platform to discuss social issues in the community as a way to have a voice in gathering assemblage work. And so um, from that and using my own experiences, I, I use it as a way to <clears throat> talk about people who I want to praise or I want to uh, commemorate mm -hmm. and how we can take pride in our communal histories and stories and display them as something to be very proud about. Nice. Do you feel that, so of course, I mean, artwork is, is your emotion. There's a lot of, there's a voice behind it. And do you feel there's a voice or an emotion that you tap into and when you do, mm. better work comes out? 
what is that? Some people are like, I need to be depressed or super happy. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not an artist like this. <laughs> to this magnitude. Yeah. I'll do little things for my children, but not. <laughs> but, or certainly like in school, but no. <laughs> Tell me, how does that work for you in the, that process? No, definitely like for me, like in my works, the struggle, like a struggle, any struggle, um, mm -hmm. uh, perseverance, uh, overcoming, um, beauty, like all of these like very strong like elements that just run through all of my work is what drives it like absolutely um i i definitely feel like uh in in my case the the materials that i use and uh the person that i'm dedicating it to are things that i harness and i want that energy to like transmute and infuse into the artwork um, so I pull on a lot of those emotions. A lot, most of the people I use are people that I'm connected to in some way, so I have a relationship with them. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm commemorating a past memory or igniting uh, thoughts from other viewers in it, I want them to, to cherish those things and to have value um, so that they don't forget. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I think my inspiration is uh, people, the relationships yeah. that we have and the, the emotions that they evoke in my soul and in my heart. So when there's somebody that I'm passionate about that I'm creating a portrait of, you definitely see it on the canvas. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. So, it, so, so it's that emotion that we're discussing, right? So, it's, yes. so when you're doing people, I mean, it's people you're passionate about or very excited to evoke. Mm -hmm. um, is it just all pure happiness or do you have like inner emotions that are coming out in this painting too that you're trying to, you know what I mean? Like there's always like subliminal messages. Yeah. You do that too. <laughs> I think there's all kinds of emotions that, that transpire in the creative process. Sure. And it's that relationship between your canvas. Um, and since I've been painting for 30 years, it's, it's a love relationship. Yeah. And it's this medium that feeds my soul. And, um, and then there's this other person. So it's a, a dialogue between the three of us, between the creative process, the canvas, myself, and the sitter, the portrait I'm creating of. of um, and so definitely there's different emotions that come out. And, and it's lovely to allow yourself to convey that with the brush strokes. Sure. Definitely, yeah. It's so as, like, oh, tell me, tell me. Oh, no. I was just gonna say, it's like a, a form of communicating. Instead of using words, you can say it best yeah. with images and, yeah. and textures. And as those things layer, it creates the emotion that you're not quite able to put in the same, mm. same sort of wording. Yeah. So it, um, you hope that people get that when they see it yeah. or it allows them to see something in a different way because that's how you find your mode of communication happening best. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like for the next Google Talk, we'll just have easels. <laughs> Absolutely. Great idea. Let's do it. Um, so I'm very proud to be uh, amongst, you know, all these Latinas, mm -hmm. right? It's wonderful. And I'm thinking, how hard is it? I mean, a Latina, a woman, basically you're an entrepreneur, right? How hard is it in the art world to be a Latina and a woman, you know, in, in, in a business that's, it's, there's a lot of men in it too. <laughs> Tell me. I want to know. Um, there are obstacles. Mm -hmm. I tend to not focus on them. I just continue to forge forward and to continue to be focused on what I'm doing in business and my creativity. So there's Yolanda Gonzalez, who is the artist, the creative, um, and there is Yolanda Gonzalez, the business person. Mm. And that was taught to me by my dad, Leopoldo Gonzalez, who is a great businessman. Um, so I think if you can separate yourself from the creative and then to the business of this, this beautiful painting, um, that you're gonna hand over, that your soul is gonna hang in somebody's home. I think it's important to focus on that. So there are obstacles, but I think like in any, in any other um, line of work, um, I just focus on a clear, straight, and narrow road, and that's to my goal. Okay. It's the la Latino backbone, and we have parents and family who yeah. teach us how to work hard, mm -hmm. yes. who yeah. show us what it's like to um, have dedication into something and um, I, I feel like I definitely pull from that too like my mom single parent mom and what she did to make things work and yeah. you use that transmute that into what goals you want to accomplish mm -hmm. and it, it sets it comes through you could tell people's drive and you could see it because they they learn from people before them not even in the same field or a different thing but they see it being applied and then it trickles down into your own personality and the way that you that way that you mute that you work sure so um uh, 
I think that there is definitely a struggle. Being an artist is not easy, right. you know. And I, I, no. I wanted you to answer no. first because she's she's got a lot more experience than uh, Sandra and I. We're we're newer in this sort of game, so I feel like uh, I learned from women like her that that their strength and their um, passageways, them pioneering these these paths for us, yeah. make it a different world for us than it was. I think oh, even yeah. in their time frame. So I acknowledge that. I really feel like they are people that I like to look up to and I learn from. Um, I'm a teacher too, so I feel like as an instructor, as a teacher, sometimes the students don't think like, oh, where's the teacher at? Oh, that's me, you know, that, that, <laughs> right here. I'm not as a, I appreciate her boldness and her strength, and I think yeah. that's something that I really admire about Thank Yolanda. You. It Thank comes you. through in her work, and um, I feel like uh, I'm, st I'm coming to my own in that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm finding that voice, and I'm figuring how that communicates with my surroundings and my neighborhood. Um, I feel like I can be a, a, a venue for communicating these things. Um, how, how I am impacted by them and how other people see this happening in our communities. So we play an important role in showing people that it, it's not the same route to, to understanding what's happening in our culture, in our neighborhood. And um, mm -hmm. I, I feel thankful to be a part of events like this because um, it's not a voice that's commonly heard. It's not a voice where we often get a platform to be uh, such a strong voice. So I appreciate um, being involved with it and being involved with artists like, like these. So. Of course. Are you kidding? You're always welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to say thank you for, for saying that. I appreciate it. And I've, um, I've worked hard to, to keep it, um, my reputation and my persona kind of a, a certain way for for you, the aura comes yeah. through. You know, yeah, it's like I, love it. I never had I never had kids. You know, I never had kids, but I felt when I would go places, I always tell my friends, we're representing. We are representing. We're responsible wherever we are. You know, we are responsible to hold up who we are and our our whole culture. Whether we're the only Chicana in the room at a function in a very astute place and. We're representing. Of course. It doesn't matter if you're in the restroom or if you're in the <laughs> dining room. People watch, and you have to represent who, you, who your culture is. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very, very, yeah. And Los Angeles, just in general, like I've moved around a bit and I've experienced different um, like art communities. But having, having arrived here uh, three years ago, I found a lot like an art community here that was just very inviting, very giving. Like, you know, finding these strongholds, like these beautiful, powerful women, like Chicana artists that, you know, that'll give you a chance. Like, you know, I'm, I'm Salvadoran, but I met this uh, amazing artist, Margaret Garcia, when I first moved here. And she's like, oh, honey, we're all the same here. Like, within like a week of me having meeting her, like she already had me kind of like meeting different people and into exhibitions. And it's just like, Everyone here is like down to help each other out, which is something that you don't really find in a lot of places. So sure. it's a lot of power here within the art community and Chicanas, Latinas in general. So are you paying it forward? You were saying you, you, know, you're, you always have a voice. You always, the people are always watching. Do you mentor? Tell us a little bit about that. Like, do, what do you do to, like, pay, so to give to the next generation? Because I know you teach. Well, right now, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I love teaching. I, I teach right now at uh, two Cal State universities, at Cal State Long Beach and Cal State Northridge, and also at Cerritos College. So um, teaching art, I feel like uh, some of my biggest mentors that I have, a lot of them were professors and some of them were art, working artists um, outside of the institution. So mm -hmm. I really try to bring, I try to think about how I can bring that communal experience and, and working with artists outside of the institution and think about how you could bring that into the institution and work with students and get them to clarify their own voices. How You're teaching them how to use a medium and then also how to speak through that medium. Yeah. So um, it's an interesting thing. I think like that helps to pay it back. I think uh, mm -hmm. I'm really happy um, to also work at the community level with places like Plaza de la Raza where I get to work with youth and those young kids that just love, you know, working with art. It's not even always about the end product. It's about the process of working and having fun. And, yeah. sure. you know, those experiences uh, coming together are, are what makes it a lot of fun. So, yeah. <laughs> of course. 
Anything over there? I have more questions. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's important to um, mentor. Um, I've taught several places throughout the 30 years that I've been creating art. I worked for, um, Plaza, uh, for Plaza de Raza teaching um, and for Para los Niños and for Inner City Arts for 14 years. Um, and it was amazing to work with the youth and um, just to teach them art, but to also teach them acceptance of who they are. Mm -hmm. And um, right now I work with Altamed, uh, teaching senior citizens, teaching oh, senior citizens cool. uh, watercolor Aww. and uh, ceramics. Hence your ARP. Yes, nice. and they're absolutely and they're absolutely lovely. Oh, that's absolutely nice. lovely. <laughs> and so you were here recently. You're saying three years ago, right? Yeah. So how how so they've embraced you, and yes. now is it too early to move to give back? Or what are you what are you thinking about in terms of like the next generation? How? Um, oh man, I'm I'm excited to be working with Plaza de la Raza. I was um, I noticed that while. I was working for Margaret Garcia, and I also worked for Frank Romero, another artist in the community. Um, I would assist them within their classes at Plaza de la Raza, and I realized that there was really nothing being offered for the next generation that's trying to move forward mm -hmm. and kind of like hone in on their skills, what they're really trying to say and express, and just like start developing their own style, their own voice through art. Um, so I proposed a, a portfolio preparation course at Plaza, and we're entering the fourth semester now, so uh -huh. I'm pretty excited about it. I, we have many beautiful, very talented artists, and just giving them a space to, to really think about the work that they're making and have them develop their style. Um, that was something that was very important for me as a kid in high school, like having that teacher that, you know, will just kind of give you the space and room mm -hmm. to do what you need to do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and just like beginning dialogue, like, having conversations about your work. Like, there's more to it than just a beautiful image, you know? Of course. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, I already feel like I'm, I'm giving into that, I'm feeding it, and, and it's feeding me as well. It's definitely like a reciprocal relationship, so. Nice, love it. So, I mean, as an artist, I mean, your surroundings shape you and, and you know, and influence you and the people you meet and all the travels that you do. I mean, you've moved around, you've traveled, you've been to, you know, you've been done work in Assisi. Um, you've had a ton of things also in the community that happen. You know, there's a lot that goes on. Um, in my mind, can you think of an anecdote or a story or like one example that truly shows that when a piece of art really made an impact? Is there like, a, like the one or is it like, no, all the time, or everything? I don't know. <laughs> Tell me, when and why? What, is, what made that impact? Oh, I got a story. Yeah, you got a story. <laughs> okay. I love it. Uh, I, I've had this idea. I make a lot of altars and a lot of uh, offerings. So I've had this idea for a long time, and I was happy to be able to do it. Finally, like I think three years into having it, it was in my sketchbook, and I finally get to do it, and got to grant money to do it. Um, but I've always wanted to do this pop-up altar installation um, dedicated to my mom. Uh, my mom, when she passed away, we inherited all of her plants. Mm -hmm. And so my sister and I started um, taking care of her plants and learning how to have this green thumb because we wanted to preserve her through these plants. Mm -hmm. And so I've been sprouting them, and my sister and I were living together, and then we were going to part ways. She was going to get a job somewhere else, and the thought of not having her plants was like, Oh, don't worry, I'm going to clone them. I'm going to, we can each have, you know. So I cloned all the plants and I started getting into cloning and I decided to make, I wanted to make a pop-up altar where people shared stories of their mothers with me and in exchange I would give them a sprouting plant from one of my mom's plants. Oh, wow. So I wanted to gather and archive all these stories and post them up on social media and on my website so that people can listen to these great stories that they told and they shared about women in their lives. So um, this past Mother's Day, the day before Mother's Day, um, I was able to set up a little pop-up on the LA Riverbed and I asked, I got a chance to do it. Set up this huge altar of beautiful green plants and you know, just seeing them sort of perky and happy there, the plants that is. <laughs> I, it was like, <laughs> like, this is for you, mom. And then also hearing everyone's stories of how women in their lives brought like so much strength and um, the amazing things that people remembered and also their connection to this living, Thing, a plant, what that meant to a lot of people. And 
um, those stories that I heard, it was like a constant. I, I felt like that was giving back because those memories stay with people for the rest of the day. Of course. They, they remember that memory about grandma or about auntie and, and it stays with them. And they thought, man, I almost forgot about that. And it was because of that moment, that event that they got to remember. And that's what was really important for me. I felt like that was, that was my anecdote. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, are you going to do it again? Oh, I'd love to. I've always wanted to do this like in a flea market or swap meet and sure. uh, have a different sort of crowd, you know, uh, and then grow that archive and just continue adding stories and adding stories to it. So Now you can add all of us. Yeah. We can join you. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra, you had a story as well. Oh, you could oh. tell, huh? Ah, uh, yes. Like, oh, got one. Um, so when I recently moved here, this is why I think it's just like, when I moved here, all the stars were just like telling me like, you're at the right place at the right time. Uh, when I had just moved here, um, I, I, was, I remember I was in Home Depot and I was like walking around. I was like, well, I need a plant for my new home, you know, like looking around and then I get an unknown phone call. Um, and when I pick up, I, Maria Guardado is on the other line, at the other end of the line. And I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with her, but she was, very prominent um, social justice figure here in Los Angeles, um, had survived through many, many things um, in El Salvador and resettled in the United States um, during the 80s. So since the 80s, she's been organizing with so many different groups. Um, she heard about the type of work that I was doing, uh, which is all based on historical collective memory, um, like stories from the Salvadoran Civil War, and she said to me, like, I'd love to meet you, and you know, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love, I'd love to have you paint me, like, have a sitting, right? Wow. So we talked about getting that together, and I worked with her for about a year and walked away from the experience with two really beautiful paintings, but throughout that, that time span, like, she shared her stories with me. Uh, we would go out for pupusas, we would, you know, it's just a lot of beautiful experiences. But um, she also sat me down to watch a documentary that was done for her. So we like sat in a room, held hands sometimes because it was just like the story was, was just really intense. Um, but she explained to me maybe midway of having spent time with her that she had cancer, like it had come back and she had a certain amount of time to live. So just having the opportunity to sit with her and paint her and share her story um, and exhibit it in different spaces like brought so many people together from different parts of her life um, that would recognize that person in the painting. Like people were, you know, I, I walked up to one person, um, a patron of mine actually, uh, and she was crying when she was seeing the, the painting. And she shared with me, like once Maria had already passed, she had shared the stories that they shared together, like through Carecen. So mm -hmm. um, I feel like it was just a very organic and natural thing that just happened. Mm -hmm. And I feel fortunate to have been able to document that and to just produce something that keeps her memory like living. So. That's pretty magical. Yeah, I'd love to show you guys the images now. <laughs> but, um, you know, but her story was, was definitely about survival. Um, there's a beauty to it, but there was also a lot of darkness to it. Um, so I think, yeah, it was just very powerful. Thank you for sharing. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yolanda, yes. with all your experience, tell me. <laughs> One Maybe, I don't know, can, one, you, can you reduce it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could reduce it. I think, I think one that is very recent, um, I was recently commissioned um, by Ultimate to create a, um, a sculpture for one of their facilities. Um, and um, I have been creating ceramics for about 20 years. Um, and um, there are these women that I make that are called infantas, and they have these chonguitos, and they're very colorful and very strong uh, women. Um, so they asked me to create this piece, which was going to end up being about six feet tall in ceramics. Wow. Oh, wow. So I started to create it. Um, we had the heads that are large orbs, about this big. Um, we created the heads, the torso, and the skirt. Uh, and it's during a time where uh, I was going through a very um, 
a difficult uh, transition in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we created the skirt, which is about this tall, wow. um, and it's going into the uh, kiln and it breaks. <gasps> Uh, and it was very symbolic of what I was going through. Oh, wow. We created another one and went into the kiln. When it came out, it was cracked. Um, then we created a third and when it came out and in some form I was in a stronger place and kind of more comfortable where I was and wasn't struggling so much with the transition, she came out fine. And How long was that process between the first one? Well, it's and been third? six months. Okay. It was six months. Yeah. Um, and then also creating the orbs and the heads for me uh, was very organic. And feeling these orbs and creating the portrait, um, I felt it was like this is what it would be like to give birth, this orb. I felt it and it was cool and the clay was, mm -hmm. the smell of the clay was just so beautiful and, and magical. Um, so I created her. It took four men to install her because she's about uh, 600 pounds. Uh, she was wow. installed, wow. Um, and so once she was installed and I turned around and I looked at her, I cried because I thought, we have both uh, completed this process together. Wow. And that's what that piece was for me. It was, it was building myself up again to continue what I had to continue. Beautiful. Very symbolic. Thank wow. You. And so is there anything that I know, like transitioning from that is like... <sighs> <laughs> like we cry. It's an artist, we, artist we life. Get back <laughs> up. <laughs> Welcome to the artist life. <laughs> so, in this roller coaster of emotions, is there anything you regret? None. Nothing. Not one. Is there some type of artwork or um, genre that you would never do? Oh wow! Can't say that. Though. I don't know. I don't know. I'm asking. You can't say never. We have sure. so much. To or that go. you wouldn't so want to, to, or that you're like have fear of. Is it like a like a thing that you're like oh, I try to avoid it? Hmm. I think if there's different mediums, because people will come to you. Um, I was sent to Japan to do printmaking, and I had done some printmaking at South Hop Graphics, but not that much. Yeah. Um, but what you do is you essentially um, interpret it, that style, that medium in your process. Mm. Okay, so you make it your own. Yes. And then therefore it's accepting to you. <laughs> but is there anything else that you're like, I don't know, I don't wanna go there. It's not something that's my style. I don't wanna, you know, maybe. <laughs> I, I, it's an interesting question. Um, it's hard, I think, um, when I think about moments in my life where I wondered if I had gone this way versus that way, I definitely thought about um, there, there was a time in my life when I had just graduated and I got my, uh, my BFA degree and I was going to be going into grad school um, and there was a time in between then when I, uh, I lost my brother unexpectedly at a very young age um, and he, um, yeah, he, he died of an overdose and I was like really distraught. And my family was out of state, and I was in California. I stayed here in California, and they had moved away, and I really felt like I wanted to be with them. And it was so difficult, but here I am in a part of my life where I'm supposed to decide where out of state I'm going to school, and it was mm -hmm. a horrible feeling mm -hmm. that should have been like much different. And so I, my heart wanted to go to New Mexico, where my family was. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had gotten an opportunity to go to grad school on a, a full ride scholarship in Indiana University. Mm -hmm. And the thought of going across the country, leaving Los Angeles and going to a place where, you know, where you really are different. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. And it was, uh, it was heart wrenching. It was my mom's advice that sort of pushed me into continuing to go into that route because it was like, that's, that's what he would have wanted you to do. But it wasn't what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go and be with them. So I wondered what my life would be like if I had continued and lived out, I don't know, maybe applied to school out there and decided to go a different route with my life. Yeah. Um, but while I was in Indiana, I totally got immersed in like, in, in using altars as a way to, to remember to heal mm. and um, to, to learn to have my own voice. So, and having, living in that place where I, there, there's not as much social diversity as we have in Los Angeles. It really forced me to have to talk about my work to people who didn't understand it. Yeah. Wow. So it, good. I, it was great. Yeah. yeah, that experience was very difficult, but also like I think that um, 
yeah, it just was a point in my life where I thought, I wonder how it would have ended up if I had gone somewhere else versus here. Of course. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Speechless a bit. Um, very strong women. Wow. I, I love all these stories. And thank you. They're very personal. Yeah. I'm very thankful that you're sharing that with us. So I feel like I'm part of, like I'm in your homes and you're like, <laughs> I need to give you some cafecito or something. Where's, so the, where's the pancito? <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, this is like really personal. I, I know, really right? Like getting in touch with his beautiful <laughs> stories. I'm like, wow, thank you. Wow. Um, okay, so so I, I want to touch a little bit more on the the whole aspect that you you just you were just touching on of you had to explain your art to people who really didn't get it yeah. or didn't understand it. How was that process? Like, have you had that experience too? Yeah. It was. I'm going to speak as a, you know, acknowledging the fact that I'm very young in this environment, um, but that I looked, it made me realize how much more I had to study and learn um, the artists who were working in this form before me and understand mm -hmm. their conversations and where it was coming from, because it helped me build up my strength to even be able to communicate these things. Mm -hmm. sure. I want to... I want to talk about um, a person's life and celebrate it without feeling the, the drabness of death and like leaving this life. And I want to celebrate them and the lessons that they taught me. And how do I do that? And, and mm -hmm. Dios Muertos and, and Altars and Ofrendas gave me that venue to be able to talk about it. So I, I studied, I, I researched, I, um, I definitely wanted to investigate a lot of Chicanas who were using altars as, a, as another way, not just to commemorate their antepasados, but as a way to talk about the social dynamics of where they're coming from mm -hmm. and, and how they can communicate that in a public atmosphere. It doesn't have to be in a, a white wall gallery. It can be in, in a public space. So um, growing up in, in LA and having places like self-help graphics that are pioneering, you know, uh, contemporary de los muertos, a Chicanoized version of de los muertos. It was like a, setting the pathway for me to to discuss all of these things and to to be who I wanted to be and talk about my family and also my situation and relate it to everyone else around me. And uh, the, even though I was all the way in Indiana, I, I had the access to resources to do this homework, to, to, to look at books and to read and research. So when I came back home, I felt like a lot more empowered to understand it when you kind of take it for granted a little bit growing up in it. Sure. So, yeah. That's great. And you empowered a ton of other people. And now they're more educated. <laughs> you empowered mm -hmm. everyone here. You yeah. Know, and, like and it's more voice. than just like calacas and makeup. And, you know, let's not forget a this. Pretty like, picture. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Thank you. <laughs> Sandra, you were going to say anything? No, maybe. But I, I do wish. have a question. Tell yeah. me. So uh, we were discussing, you know, this voice that you have as artists. How has social media or digital or technology helped your careers? Or, or not, I mean, maybe not. <laughs> well, I mean, it helps in the sense of like having you connected with so many of your peers and your colleagues and I mean, being able to research and especially like the way that I gather like source material. Sure. Um, mm. It's very, you know, I very much needed the internet and social media to be able to do that. Um, but in particular, Maybe, I don't know, maybe not. Yeah, I, I'm very um, intrigued by the, um, by the fact that, you know, art is now accessible to all, yeah. right? So the minute you do something, it is seen by millions and millions of ball, eyeballs all over the yeah. world instantly. Yeah. And so when you're making this now, because like, it's different, like maybe even 30 years ago, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you're creating I, something I now. Hear I was excited <laughs> about beepers, <laughs> like, you know. Well, your age me. So does it? So does How can I make love with people? <laughs> turn, turn it around. It says it's not 8383. Three, it's love. It's 143. 143. Three. I was there too. Yeah, I remember the phones with the long cords. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. Yolanda, I have a question for you then. So in the 30 year span, you've, you've gone from you didn't have digital, really, mm -hmm. to now having people see your artwork if they wanted to mm -hmm. around the world. Does it change now your perspective when you're painting? Uh, in the sense that before people would go and, you know, wherever you had the exhibition, people would see it. You know, it was that specific people. Maybe you toured. Whatever it is, you, those were the people who saw it, right? Who seeked it out. But now anybody can see it and share it. Does that change how you paint now, and the voice or the message you want to give? 
Um, I think it changes a lot of things except for the way I paint. Okay. Because the painting process and my relationship with the creative process um, is very pure to me. It's very sacred. And so that is very strong, one of the strongest relationships I have. Okay. Um, and, but it's very exciting to me to, um, to share. And I, what I like to do is put um, a piece when I first start the sketch, the rough, when it's almost done and then when it's completed. So people can kind of see the process nice. of what's happening, of creation, so be it. Um, so, you know, and people put their kids' pictures every month on, on <laughs> Facebook, and I put my paintings every month on Facebook. <laughs> you know, those are my babies. That's I it. I think that's what's exciting about it is like we get to see like the studio practice unfurled in front of us on, you know, Instagram and Facebook. So it's yeah. like, yeah. That they we and it's also hard to get used to it to opening people up to that process. Like you know, how much, how much do you want to show? Like how much Boy. is exposed? You know, yeah. mm. like you want to keep some of those things private, yeah. right? Yeah, it's whatever you're comfortable with. You know what yeah. I mean? It's whatever you're comfortable really sharing because it's out there. And once it's out there, it's out there. Yeah. But it is amazing, and I've utilized it to the fullest. Where um, you know. You send out your message, you know, and you send out your images, and then you represent messages that need to be represented as well. Of course. Um, but I think it's 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 a fascinating, fascinating uh, process. You know, the internet. It's just fascinating to me. And I'm I'm such a gadget person. I love I love that. So anything I can get my little hands on and and. Um, expose you know people to what's going on or in my world my little utopian strange world it's there it's great it's a uh, it's exciting I feel like we're living in a world where there's all kinds of new technology happening all the time mm -hmm. and uh, as artists we get to figure out how to interpret that and use that and um, so like I'm a, a printmaker and it's one of those like classic dying forms that people don't like to use anymore because mm -hmm. it's very cumbersome Mm. But there's always this like conversation on how we're pulling from new technology to influence our work. Mm -hmm. So how do we keep it relevant in this age of like constant technology upgrades, you know? Of so um, I like to see how it impacts the, the conversation I want to have or the, the way I envision a piece happening. Um, there's some of the ways that I've used it is I'm a graphic designer, so a lot of the work also starts off on the computer using digital programs mm. or digitizing the work somehow. And then, um, like, it's seeing how the work can transmute. I've had a chance to use CNC router machines to create, like, custom furniture pieces nice. that are reminiscent of my papel picado patterns. And that was an amazing experience. Nice. Or, like, laser cutting machines to take papel picado in a whole mm. other world. What happens when the machine cuts it out? And you have these little burned edges and, you know, <laughs> how, how those things start to impact the, the message. And I just, I, I'd be excited to be able to, to play with it even more. Um, I think what becomes the biggest deterrent is accessibility. Mm. Um, it's expensive, it's hard to get access to, so um, especially once you're outside and you don't have access to like a university or anything like that, how do you, how do you use this equipment um, <laughs> in your work? So um, yeah, I'd be excited to, to try to learn to use it more and uh, it's, it provides another way for you to have that communication. So any other way that I can try to use uh, technology. It, I've used it for sharing the stories that I'm collecting to have this online archive or an online altar. Um, so I, I try to use it as much as possible, but I think that um, there's also some deterrence because of the accessibility of it too. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, the big machines you're talking about too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm interested in how they collide though. How do you take the old school and the classic with like the new technology? Mm. So And there's like, like 3D printers now too. Yeah, yeah, 3D printing. I'd love to to mess around with that kind of machinery. Yeah. Nice. Well, so now I'm going to open it up to the audience as well. If you have any questions at all, please, this is your time to um there's the, there's the uh, microphone. See the one we were talking about, the one you can throw the around. Google Cube. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have questions? Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Eric. So first of all, thank you hi. guys for spending an afternoon with us. I thought this was really interesting and really awesome and I'm really happy that you guys uh, came by. Uh, so now my question is, uh, a few months ago there was like a, um, a case in Canada where a writer was criticized for saying that 
other writers and artists should take and write from the point of view of different ethnicities, cultures, genders, and background. And so I was kind of curious to hear what you guys thought, if you would encourage others to um, sort of take the point of view of people that come from different backgrounds that they do. I think that's a big responsibility. It is, yeah. I only have I my own view, <laughs> and um, I can't expect everybody to, mm -hmm. to respect um, or accept my point of view on a whole of a culture. I don't, yeah. on ethnicity, I don't think that's, I mean, that's I right. I mean, I think any artist out there that's making work, I mean, their true aspiration should be to convey a truly honest perspective of their own. So I feel like being able to share that, I mean, that's how other people are able to learn about it, right? Mm -hmm. But to put yourself in a different place, it's, it's, it gets tricky. Of course. You don't want to be put in a position where you're the spokesperson for everyone, right. and that just doesn't seem fair. It's important to be inclusive, to be aware, um, but to, to be put in the position of, you know, I'm the spokesperson for Latinas, and I would never want that, you know, that responsibility is too many, too many voices out there to be heard. So, yeah, that's, that's a pretty tough criticism. <laughs> yeah. It's also a lot Good of question. hard work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. And I mean, I completely agree. Like it's, I mean, there's a variety of opinions about it, I guess. Um, and, you know, like on one side, you know, you should say like, oh, you know, if by encouraging people to talk about cultures that are different than their own, you encourage them to uh, find commonalities, to find ways to, to, to empathize. And then from the other point of view, kind of like you said, it's, well, there are many people that could talk about this particular experience, so why is somebody that may not have as much experience or knowledge in that background take it upon themselves to, to talk about it? Mm -hmm. um, so I was kind of curious to hear what you guys thought, so thank you. Thank you, thank you for thank the you. question. So cool. <laughs> um, ladies, thank you so much for being here, and I want to take it to the business perspective. Um, Women traditionally make 72 cents of the dollar of males. Uh, black women make 62 cents, and Latinas even less. So I'm wondering, in terms of your male counterparts as artists, when you're comparing art to art, um, do you find yourself having to, or not making as much as men do in the industry? Do we choose to price it less then? No, Is that what no, you're saying? No, no, are people wanting you to charge less because ah. you're women? Or Latinas. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that on both ends of the different artists I've worked with since being in Los Angeles. Mm. Like the more, you know, like the more recognized, like male figure, and you know, a woman that's been like struggling and really putting in the work, like since she began, like decades ago, you know, and uh, just realizing like that there's that like women tend to kind of like underprice their work or like, like, I don't know, it's, it is, it's difficult. I, I think uh, as a woman artist, it's, um, it's important not to underprice my work, um, to value my work for the years that I've been creating art and it's been 30 long years. Um, and I think it's a huge responsibility for the artists, the young artists who are following me, to open the door for them, not only through my art, but through my business sense. So you educate people to pay if they want a piece of your art. They want a piece of your soul, they're paying for it properly. And if they don't buy it at that price, then they don't deserve it. So. And if they don't buy it at that price, somebody else will. You know, and I have you know little pieces. You can get a little piece about this big. You could take that home. That'll be fine. Nice. <laughs> just I, gotta, yeah, yeah, you just gotta know your worth and like you know and yeah. stick to it. And it's hard because a lot of artists are not uh, business people. Mm -hmm. um, I it's think hard. it's difficult yeah. to separate yeah. because you're emotionally involved to this this piece yeah. of art. But then what you do is you find somebody who you trust to represent your art, mm -hmm. and and to market it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I struggle with that a lot as well because I, I worry about accessibility. And I think that when like, those things are true, 
uh, pricing and the time that's in, and what you've invested, where your career is at, all of those things that factor into pricing. And then I, some of the things I worry about is like, who can buy that? Who is going to be able to buy that? Who am I making it for? Mm -hmm. And um, even though I know it's not going to make me very much money, I want my artwork to be accessible. I want it, I don't want it to be unreachable, unattainable for people to be able to purchase. So I, I need to hire a business person. <laughs> like, I, know, right? I feel like I, I, want a, I want a little of both. I think that uh, creating tiers of work that you can sell for different prices helps to, yeah. to make things that are accessible. And um, you know, there, you have bigger ideas. A, a lot of my work is installation artwork too. So there's never like really, I don't really intend on, it's a, it's a temporary installation and it exists for that point in time. So sales a lot of times aren't really, the, the driving force is more like, how can I complete this idea? Mm -hmm. um, I, I just moved back to Los Angeles after living away for six years. And um, this past year that I've been back, I've really been like forced to think that the people and the friends that I've met have really made me think a lot about uh, pricing. And mm -hmm. I was sort of uh, living in, I feel like my own little dream world of, I just want to do the idea, man. I'm just trying to get this idea out there. The cash wasn't even about it. It wasn't, and, and that's kind of the struggling part. So that's why I teach. <laughs> For, you know, that's one of the reasons why I teach. Of course. <laughs> Gotta have so that, that side can, job. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know that. So I can have that, that freeness to be able to like create what I want to create and not be driven by the price. But it's a, it's a struggling game of back and forth. And, you know, Yolanda's very established and, and has a, a lot of years, and, and I think that I hope one day to kind of get to uh, a level where I, I can be a lot more uh, demanding with it, too. Um, but I also think uh, it, there's a line, too, about where you want to be open and, and have people find you and get mm -hmm. to know you and, and create that relationship through being a, a little more accessible. Um, yeah, it's difficult. It's very difficult. I think as far as accessibility, if, if there somebody comes into the studio and they really want a piece, instead of Fine. lowering the price, uh, you know, if it's a small piece or something, I'll just give it to them. Wow. You're like, I got payment plans. <laughs> we got it. No, no. I literally yeah. just say, <laughs> I just say, take it. Take it. If you want it, take it. Yeah. yeah. But, but um, and then there's also, like I have a watercolor series that's really, really reasonable for my work. And, but some of the paintings will, now, you know, when I was your guys' age, I would paint five, six, seven, ten paintings in a week. It was just, now. <laughs> Pump it out. No, no. <laughs> yeah. it was, it was good. That's why I have shoulder pain. <laughs> but now, you know, it's once a month. It's just, it's, you know, it slows really down. Good, yeah. but, it, but that's just where I'm at, you know, that's just. That's just what 30 years of, of the process is taking me, and I have to be accepting of that. I'm not 25 anymore, mm -hmm. you know. But um, anytime you need, you you want to come over and talk, you know, we'll talk. I'm there. I'm open to that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So I'm going to end with one last one, since many other questions. <laughs> um, so we have. Um, Back to the next generation. I love, mm -hmm. um, there's a ton of people who not only are digital natives, right? They, they don't know anything else but the online world, but also are really intrigued or really want to explore art as part of who they are, maybe as their career, or as part of their. What advice can you give them for this next generation of, mm -hmm. of artists? You know, I always believe that can't just have technology, can't just have art. I think the combination works really nicely now, mm -hmm. um, especially now with STEAM, right, where you can do both. Um, what, what advice can you give the next generation of people or kids who want to pursue art? I think just, just it's just it's the old classic, you know, follow your dream. But now the dream is very large and vast with, with the internet. Um, and I think it's amazing for them to have that accessibility to the internet, but I also think that the classic way of learning art is very important. So I think if there's a way to have the classic way of learning art, which is pencil, charcoal, still life, you know, um, and then transfer that into the internet, you know, and combine it and incorporate it and collaborate with it. I think that's the fascinating part of the new art we're going to be seeing um, in the future, you know. Mm. Nice. Know where you come from.
continue to be curious, explore, and just continue to ask questions like within your own work. Definitely. Nice. Um, I don't know. I, I, I've thought about this question in a few different ways. There's a lot of artists now who solely exist on social media. Like their main venues are on social media. Mm -hmm. And they have a really hard time doing the classic stuff, you know, the like, nah, pa que? like I'm already got this many followers and they're all, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a different way of thinking. Mm -hmm. But I think that's the challenge of how the classic and the <coughs> traditional still engage that newer age. Mm -hmm. um, because they found ways to bypass a lot of the traditional stuff. Why do I need to learn how to draw the figure if I'm doing, you know, um, specific performances in random spots in LA and I'm getting, uh, you know, commissions and they're getting paid for doing it. So it's, it's the challenge that I think that the institution hasn't quite yet led up to learning how to teach those students how to keep up with it all because they're struggling with keeping up with that new technology. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think too that I remember being a student and the, 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 the mode of thinking being like concept, 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 and those things are really amazing. Um, you need, if you're, if you're wanting to be an artist, there's different types of artists. Some people just paint in their basements and never expose it to the public. It's about that moment mm -hmm. that they're creating mm -hmm. and it's not really about sharing it with everybody. Some other mm -hmm. people have the yearning to want to share it out in the public and it's about that communication, mm -hmm. the way that people perceive it in a public space. And that's what drives that force. So I don't know that I would have like one piece of advice for artists. It would yeah. be like, yeah. you know, what's your, what's your main goal for this, you know? Um, yeah, it's like STEM is huge right now in schools. And you hear, like, I, I'm looking for jobs all the time, and they want to know how you can incorporate um, STEM into your, your curriculum. And uh, I think that acceleratingly, it's more important because the, the schools have stripped away, like, a lot of those arts and creatives out of the school. Mm -hmm. But they want to bring it on, uh, on again as an educational component mm -hmm. to, teach them, yeah. to teach them science, to teach them all these other things. But where can art exist just for art? Like, why, right. when you're a kid, you think you're thinking about concept? No, you're remembering that fun part of why you want to make art, of what it is to create. And it's important not to lose that. Like, we're so strained, I think, to have this greater, bigger social message, and those things are very important. But there should also still live a space where you can just be free to create just because, and you may not know why, yeah. but it, 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 you need to have that happen at the same time that other people are more driven by that message. So to have both existing simultaneously, I think, and not knock people down for having a different way of thinking about it or working with it. Yeah. That's great. I agree completely. I think there's a space for both yeah. and also separately. Yeah. And together, why not? Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> Again, thank you so, so much. Thank you. You've been thank wonderful. You. Thank you for sharing such beautiful personal stories, for allowing us to have and share your beautiful work right here in our halls. Um, and just for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. <laughs>